So, um, yeah, like Kobe said earlier, uh, Tamara and Randall were meant to be here giving a presentation. Um, building modern service-oriented architectures. I can't even get through that without trying to fall asleep. So, yeah, so they asked me to give it on their behalf. So, my name's Tamara. I'm Randall Thomas. <laughs> And so uh, we were too busy enjoying our whiskey last night to really put this presentation together for you. But, you know, I, as I was enjoying the whiskey last night, I, uh, you know, I came up with this alternative idea of, hey, what if Thunderbolt Labs sponsored an open whiskey bar? So that just sounded great to me. So yeah, woohoo! You can all thank me, Randall, later. <laughs> Except for the fact that exactly none of that is happening. So, um, Rain, where are you? Stephen Baker, where are you? Get up here. And Eric. So, if you've been to RubyConf and you've seen our uh, So You Think You Can Code panel, where we basically just get up here and argue with each other, that's pretty much what we're gonna do. So, hope you enjoy it. Uh, we're gonna take a, we're, we'd like to take questions, so if there's anything that you would like to know how not to do, Feel free to just uh, toss a hand up and we'll tell you how not to do it because that's what we're really, really good at. Andre! How do I not write string? How do you not write Ben string? I'm actually going to give this one to Rain. I can't think of a case where we'd ever not want to write Ben string, so I can't answer that. Literally, you literally always want Ben string. All, all of the time. And I want whiskey. All right. So, have you guys uh, have you guys seen the recent blog post about Unclear and, and Rails possibly failing? No. Has anyone has anyone seen that? No. Don't so, be silly. How do we feel about Rails being a failure now, which is a fact because it's on the internet? It was never successful in the first place. <laughs> yeah. It never scaled. Wait, is this child? Right, post? exactly. It never scaled. It wasn't web scale. It was just it was just a thing to tie us over between COBOL and no. Uh, and no. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Amazon on Rails. Like what? What about Intercal? Intercal on stilts? What was that? <laughs> yes. So this is only going to work if you guys ask questions. So start doing that. Or heckle. Cool. This, this, this is something, I don't actually know exactly what it is, but it's made by McFinnemans. It's Hogshead. You mean, it's Hogshead? Yeah, you can get it in back. We have a question here? Yeah. This, this is semi-serious, so you can throw it out. We have another question in the back. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. Okay, no, let, me, let me just bring my mic around. I can yell. Okay. Make Colton do it. Yeah, where's Colton? Do all our bitch work. Yeah, where's hey, Colton? Yeah. Colton, where are you at? Colton's in charge. I didn't even hear the question. But I have a mic. I haven't asked yet. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I wanted to know, uh, Twitter switched off of uh, Rails, mostly. Um, Go ahead. I want to know, is it is it possible to make it scale at that level? Or yeah. do we have to go on to something? Serious questions or no? Or serious answers or no? Oh, I've got a, I've got a work, it's an opera app at work that does three billion requests a week. That's all. <laughs> That's, <laughs> That's it. I mean, I don't know how many Twitter does a week, so. Audience participation. I process at least 15% of Twitter <laughs> every day, all day long, 24 hours a day. Good job. How much staff? In Ruby. How much staff, Jeremy? Staff? Yeah. Uh, we're up to, well, we were two for a while, we're up to <laughs> seven. Oh my god. Yeah, it's amazing. How many in here? When are you moving to Scotland? Oh, uh, actually, our intern took over for uh, two Rails developers that left. So. Require. Yeah, Colton's here. So if anybody needs a drink, require relative versus require with load path mangling. If you make a load path, then you're doing a good job. Great job. Awesome. Keep it up. Yep. Every jam. Eight plus. <laughs> 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 
make sure make sure there's like make sure no other gems too. To look at as well. Yeah, other gems too. Uh, our spec did that once. It was great. Yeah, I, and personally, I would really I would like to request that everyone use unship to do that. Oh yeah, I forgot about that. Are you guys? Find other things that you have that you don't want there, and then remove them. As part of it. <laughs> don't don't ever forget that you have access can be to like rails. Yeah. You can change the state of anything. And don't hold, on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Who are you guys? I I, would, I just said that. I'm sorry. That's fine. We're just some people. It's no big deal. Just some people with whiskey. <laughs> oh, and and if you want to go for bonus points, delete stuff out of loaded features. So what questions? What, what questions should we ask? Right, sorry, sorry. Seriously though. Um, I'm, let's do the intro. Okay. I'm, I'm Ben. I've been doing Ruby for a few years. That's yeah. Ben. It's blithing, not blathing. Blithing. Yeah. Oh, he gets oh. so, so pissed off when he does that. My name is Ben Blithing. What <laughs> Blithing. Say it slow. Uh, Alright, the other thing that uh, the, the other thing that Ben does in the community, um, Ben and a guy named Shane Becker actually created the first conference to run in Seattle. Actually second because RubyConf was held there in two thousand and two. So um, anyway, so so Ben and Shane Becker put together a Cascadia Ruby Conference. And they announced it recently. It's going to be coming up the first weekend in August in Seattle. Um, so Ben has been an active part of the community. Thank you for pimping my conference, Kevin. You're welcome. I wasn't going to do it myself. Ever. Uh, I'm trying to decide if I want to do the rest of these. Um, so everyone does the person just next one. Okay. Yeah. So um, this is a uh, this is Stephen Baker. He's Canadian. You ask, ask him to say out. <laughs> out. Yeah. No, it's good. Um, uh, Steven, let's see. <laughs> uh, most recently, Steven was working. I don't actually have any idea. I think he was a G5, whatever. It doesn't really matter. I was at G5, and it sucks so bad. <laughs> uh, so. Conference sponsors G5, apparently so. <laughs> They're awesome, awesome people, and I really like a G5. Next. Yeah. Okay, do I get to talk about Eric? Yeah. Oh, no. No? Oh. no. <laughs> you do. You do. You do. I'm just going to take uh, organizer prerogative here. and uh, But in the other thing that Baker has done, in spite of um, generally not wanting to claim it, um, he wrote the first version of RSpec before turning it over to Dave Estelle's and... No, Estelle's had fuck all to do with RSpec. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Clement, Clemski. Let me, let me, let me, let me set, let, let set the record state here. Uh, Shalimsky. Shalimsky, oh, sorry, not, not Estelle's. No. Um, <laughs> so now I'm going to give the mic back to, to Baker and let him tell you about Eric. Okay. Eric's from Seattle, and he wrote everything you use, or everything, something that is required by everything you use. Sometimes he writes things that get required automatically, like Ho. Yes. yes. How many people love Ho? Everybody. Yes, you do. If you don't love Ho, get out. But... <laughs> is there anyone who likes Ho that's not from Seattle, besides Mike? Okay, fine. He was in town. Canada's kind of like Seattle. Canada. Canada. It's the <laughs> Look, if Seattle was just 10% cooler, it'd be in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> so this is... Uh, oh, Kobe. More, more organizer progress. So, uh, yeah, Eric, um, if, if you didn't catch the references, he goes by Dr. Brain on Twitter. Uh, I'm right. Okay. <laughs> All right, Clay, thank you. <laughs> and uh, he also he maintains Ruby Gems is a Ruby core committer, um, and I hired him once. 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 <laughs> once. He, he, he's thinking about hiring me again. So. Well, he's trying. Maybe. He's trying to the okay. <laughs> so uh, this is Rain, and Rain is getting married next week. <laughs> and uh, let's see, Rain. Let's see, Rain spoke last year and then got harassed by a man wearing a kilt who was 
say rather inappropriate things. So fortunately, he's not here again. And uh, Rain is much happier. I don't, I don't know what else to say about Rain. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> purple pimp hat goes really well with the orange hair, though. Yes, it would. Um, <laughs> let's see, Rain. I did, it took me about a year before I pronounced his name right. I kept wanting to call him Ryan. Um, Rain is currently at he is currently at Living Social. He's done lots of interesting things with Cloud at PHP Fog, where they did a lot of Ruby, um, at least on the underside of things. Ironically enough. Um, he's also presented and been active in the community for, I don't know how many years, longer than I have been. Um, true? Yeah, I, I started in 06, so. Apparently, apparently someone knows that it's seven years. And uh, he, he generally hosts the, the last two years has hosted the Think You Can Code presentations at RubyConf, and if you haven't seen those, now I'm gonna pick my own company, uh, you can go to confreaks.com and look at the talks that are there from previous years. They generally go better than this one is right now. Yeah, I guarantee they're a lot funnier than this, this one. This one is not going up there. No. <laughs> There's not even, this isn't even being recorded, thank God. I'm also so not a Ruby core committer. <laughs> and I don't maintain uh, Ruby gems. And this is Renee, who I've never met before in my life. So You met her last yes. night. Before, 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 the before the conference. Before the conference. So I can't really say anything, but if someone else would like to say something, that would be really awesome. Uh, Renee lives in Seattle, uh, and she was formerly of Blue Box Group, and now she works for herself, which she says is much, much better. <laughs> it's, um, the, the best thing about Renee is if you can get her to start laughing even a little, she's not going to stop until tomorrow. <laughs> Uh, the other thing that Renee has done a tremendous amount of work in, in the community is an organization called Rails Bridge. Um, so she was actually down here the last two days and ran a workshop yesterday. And for those that you don't know, Rails Bridge is an effort or a group that's designed to help get more women involved with software development, specifically the Ruby and Rails community. Um, so the workshop had one requirement, you either had to be female or you had to accompany one to the workshop that we had. Um, and had great attendance with that yesterday. So um, that gives you a brief overview of who they all are. Um, they're also uh, helping me call a time slot right now that snow has caused to be an issue. Yeah, to be completely clear, none of us knew about this before last night when we were already drunk. So uh, I apologize on behalf of all of my panel mates, except for Rain, if this is completely horrible. Rain. You're the one that told me not to do my slides, so it's all on Yeah, that's true, okay, thanks. So, uh, um, I have a question, okay. um, unless I wasn't paying attention. Uh, where did no. these friends, like Randall and Tamara? They're like just sitting around the San Francisco doing work? It, to this my knowledge, yeah. really stupid for them to do. Did they skip free beer to work? Yes. <laughs> so the question was, where where the hell are Tamara and Randall? And as far as I know, they're being slackers billing in San Francisco right now. <laughs> Precisely the question I asked Tamara last night, to be clear. Yes. <laughs> you know what? Randall, no, Randall bought me a lot question. of booze over the right. years. A lot of booze. I can't. I have nothing bad to say about Randall. <laughs> <laughs> I have not been sober around that guy very often. <laughs> I, I have a question for you. Um, whiskey, rocks, or uh, meat? Rocks. Meat. Whatever, whatever you want. <laughs> I like I, this. Neat, personally, but it's up to you. Double. I'm not a big fan of ice. It's straight out the bottle. <laughs> it depends on the Scotch or Irish whiskey, really. What are you going to say with Irish people? This is one of the things Americans do better than Canadians. Come on. What are you racist? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I'm one of three. I'm Welsh, so whatever. <laughs> Can I ask a vaguely Ruby related question? No. 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 Yes. Are we asking the audience a Ruby No. So my vaguely Ruby related question is, what do you guys think about uh, the talk about the new Rails 4 
or as I like to call it, Rails forever. <laughs> Anybody out there want to jump in on this? Uh, I hear it's coming out around the time that TextMate 3 comes out. <laughs> so it TextMate forever. <laughs> so, so I've known, I've worked with uh, Aaron Patterson for, for many years, and for about the last two years he's been working on Rails, and when he started he had fewer gray hairs. But I think that is for your benefit because Rails 4 will be amazing. He's uh, also older now. I don't know about that. So that if you get older, you get older. Can you stop letting no, facts get in the way of a good story? <laughs> yeah, so so working with working with Aaron, watching him do Rails, there's a lot of, of face palms and then he looks at his sausage and then he goes and plays with his hat. So that's that's what Aaron does too. It right does it in any order? Sometimes it goes it goes uh, Rails sausage cat sausage. Correct way to put it is it he looks at his hat and then he goes and plays with his sausage. I haven't seen him uh, actually play with the sausage yet. No, he's got that. It's not in person. No, he's got he's got a case. I'm talking about actual sausage. Can I have some sausage? Yes. 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 Isn't that the question that I just fucking asked? No! Seriously, uh, <laughs> each one of you, what do you want to see Rails fall to come? I want oh. to see people using it. No! <laughs> yeah. Oh, seriously, I don't see people already using Rails The work Rails right 3. now is all between, it's like, like uh, let's upgrade this Rails 2 app to a Rails 3 app. And it's, yeah. it's, it's become, you know, a bit of a pain in the ass in some cases. And so for the future, and I'm being completely serious here, I would like people to focus on, right, good quality code, Loosen your coupling a little bit so that when you have to change frameworks, it's not a big, a huge pain in the ass. And that's what I would like to see for Rails 4. I know that's a pipe dream. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I killed that. No, you're the only one. <laughs> I'm not, okay, who else has a question? I, yes, okay. Yeah, you. Um, I actually, I was about to say in the last question, I haven't written any Rails since like 2006. Um, I've been just pure Ruby uh, backend stuff for the most part since then. I occasionally will maintain a Rails app but wherever I'm working, but most of the time, yeah, I'm just writing Ruby. Yeah, you're right. No, I um, right now I work for Living Social, and, and uh, <laughs> yeah, um, we're we're building. We're the funny thing to bring it back to Tamer shit is that we're actually uh, we're actually moving towards a service oriented architecture using Ruby for the backend services. Some of them are HTTP, some of them aren't. Um, the HTTP ones, for the most part, aren't Rails. So, yeah. anyway, serious answer. Sorry. I haven't I haven't done much Rails either in the last two years, but I'm mostly committing on RDoc, Ruby Gems, Rake, Ruby, whatever. Um, all the important stuff. All, all, the, all the stuff, all the, all the back-end ecosystem stuff that everything else depends on. Um, but I also feel like I use Ruby to do all of the random fun programming stuff I want to do as well. Like I've got Ruby script to control my fireplace. That's pretty sweet. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I use Ruby to work on a little project called Puppet, which uh, is used by a lot of organizations that you've probably heard of, like New York Stock Exchange. And for the record, when their servers went down, that was not Puppet's fault. <laughs> uh, so, so Puppet is a configuration management tool that's managing possibly on the order of 100,000 or more machines around the world in hundreds or thousands of organizations, a lot of universities. It's it's as old as Rails, it's as big as Rails, and it's used in far more real world situations. It's old, it's, it's, it's about, I don't want to get into an argument about that. It's, it's, a, it's almost as old as Rails. It's also and, almost as good as Sea of Engine. And it's almost as good as Chef. Nice. No, but there, there, in the same way that it's almost as old as Rails. No, last time you said 
Um, well, so I was going to say, uh, chef scripts I've been using a lot to set up servers and, uh, and contrast to Puppet, but I like a little better. They are both Ruby, so it's all, it's all Ruby, it's not Rails. Uh, also, I was going to say, uh, has anybody played with the uh, Duino chips that you can program in Ruby? Yeah, yes. Yeah, they're really cool. So, where to one, they're awesome. There are a lot of things you can't do. Yeah, really. Yeah, it's train completed. Exactly. That's stupid. You should feel stupid. Unreal life is train completed. Somebody like new new question. Right, right. So, so what are the things in Ruby that you should know that you don't know? The the panel was talking over you. I heard him. What are the things in Ruby that People should know that they don't know. Ben String. Ben String. What is Obviously. That? What? Call CC. Oh, for Christ's sake. Um, go watch the second so you think you can code. Ben String is not, it's not worth spending any mental energy on. I mean, for you, I don't mind, but for you, it's not worth it. Oh, uh, sure. Okay, fine. Serious questions or serious answers. I wish more people understood the difference between um, extend and include. Oh, I'm totally with you. I would, like, I would like to see less uh, abuse of inheritance. I don't. Use your words. We've only got a few minutes. <laughs> I would like for people to use better names for classes and modules than yes. base, yeah. instance methods, and class methods. Yes, it's a module. It contains methods, asshole. Name it something smart. Uh, so, I want people to use fewer complicated mocking frameworks and just use def. Is zero acceptable? Fewer amount of zero, zero is good. That's the best number of mocking frameworks. Yes. Def. You just use def. Maybe, maybe class.new. We want to throw that in there, but def. Yeah. Shit, anonymous classes. I wish more people did that. I did that recently, so there you go. Are we on time? Great. 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 The question is, if you could rename the SWAT operator, what would you rename it to? What's wrong with SWAT? Nothing. Blob. What would you call it? Cool. I would call it. I would call it the, the thing that sometimes turns arrays into not arrays, and sometimes turns not arrays into arrays. <laughs> operator. <laughs> Base argument. Don't let it the core. Back to hoe, as, as I'm sure we all have sometime. Never mind. Eric, this is all you Yeah. So, I, actually, I, I wrote a blog post about this, so you can get a, a lengthy argument. But for everyone who has not read it, um, there was a, a lovely person who decided that. Ruby should have man pages ship with them. I think this is a fantastic idea. More documentation is great. However, the way that he did it to package it with your gem was you would require this file in this library in your gem spec. And then it would go and monkey patch Ruby gems and throw files in there. Kind of like, well, no. no it's with the dependency thing like, oh, uh, rake can do for you. And then you just have a rake task, and you just say, oh, well, this depends on the pack package task depends on this. Put the stuff in the right spot, done. And then you can use it with whatever you want. Negative points for simplifying things. We all use Rails. <laughs> From time to time. Yeah. Uh, Yehuda, come on oh, down. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, sorry. When we do when we do so you think you can code at uh, at RubyConf, we make it really clear up front that you should not listen to anything we say. And I guess we failed to do that today, so sorry. You know, we have an empty chair if you want it. Yeah! Also, also, there's lots of shit in the gem spec that you shouldn't touch, and you don't know which one it is. And I can tell you, but you won't read it, because I've been doing this way too long, and I know people don't read it. So don't do that. Don't read it? Don't read the documentation. Gotcha. Yes, because you already won't. Because more documentation is good. So don't, don't read it. So I, I have a question that's a follow-up to the what, what do we wish people used more in Ruby, which is what do we wish people used less in Ruby, starting with you then? Did I give you some time? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Ruby 1A. Yeah. Ruby Enterprise Edition. Yeah. I hate that shit. That drives me crazy. Rescue from Inception. Yes. Rescue nil. Yeah, yeah. Uh, trailing rescue nils. That's gross. Wait, can you explain So, like, you know, when you uh, when you call something and you don't want it to blow up, so you put rescue nil at the end, so it just returns nil instead of blowing up, instead of actually telling you that you really had an exceptional case. Yeah. Is this law called Demeter? I would like people to do less of that. Less Demeter. No, less, <laughs> less throwing away exceptions that are meaningful. The problem with that case is that often you may have uh, The problem with that case is that often you may have another exception that gets thrown for some other reason and now you're swallowing all exceptions. When if you just rescue like IO error or whatever the error would you are trying to rescue is, now you do not swallow exceptions. That you can the big problem with that is that it breaks the chain of evidence. So if you're getting a backtrace, you're trying to figure out where something is wrong, rescue nil just stops that chain, and then you're stuck in, no, in nowhere. And you have no way to figure out where to go next to figure out what's wrong. And the only way to figure it out is to remove the rescue nil. But if you need to do that, why is it there in the first place? Maybe you should just not cause errors that you expect to happen. Just don't ever do it. Yeah, sorry, we got we got into teaching there again. Anybody have a question that doesn't have a real answer? <laughs> yes. Why do we have to have no RI and no R dot? Why can't we just assume that and have options to add RI and R dot? Yeah, seriously, come on. Because documentation is good and more is better. No, no, oh no. So I have many, many and varied opinions on this. <laughs> So uh, I have a question, just sort of to frame this a little bit. Why do you want no RDoc and no RI? Why do you not want documentation? Okay, so should the should the documentation be generated ahead of time and ship with the gem that way? No, Oh, that's awesome if you have an internet connection, which I almost never do. Well, how do you right. install a gym without the internet? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not kidding. Okay, no, so I, I, the problem that I have with no RDoc and no RI is that people are installing stuff without documentation. Okay, and I don't have a problem with this on a per project, on a local basis. For this project, I don't want, I just said project, you are welcome. <laughs> <laughs> on this project, I don't want documentation because I have it elsewhere at the system level. And that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. That should be explicit. When you're in the default in Ruby Gems, should be always to install documentation because I want you to have that. As somebody who writes documentation from time to time, I want you to read it. I think the bigger problem. I don't know is that R doc and R I. Gem help N I think has how to go and turn it off question. by default. How many if that is your you preference. How many no. of you have ever oh, used that? Actually, you saw that because he was talking. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Hold the mic. How many of you have ever actually used the documentation that is generated when you install a gem? So I have used it and it's still the wrong default. If you need it, go generate. It's fine. The, the, problem is, the problem is that we are basically making everyone pay a tax for something that I use 0.5% of the time, but everyone has to pay the tax all the time and nobody understands why. Most people have never used that documentation. You're the fringe case, though. You, you, you're the fringe case. Yeah. Yeah. Fringe case, case 
French case how? You're the one percent that uses that documentation that's installed. You're I'm the one percent that uses the documentation. I, I, I didn't count I one percent of hands. <laughs> if, if I'm the one percent that uses the documentation. I've got what I was going to say now. I'm not talking about the documentation in general. I'm talking about the documentation that's installed with the end. But he just asked us to have the hands on it. So you can always run, you can always generate that later, right? So the question is when you do gem install Rails, when a new user does gem install Rails, somebody who never used Rails before, and he types in pseudo gem install Rails because that's what someone told him to do, now they have to wait five minutes to get everything up and running, we should try to make that amount of time be less. Yes. If the solution to that is make RDoc faster, that's great. But the fact of the matter is that today, we are making people wait an extremely long amount of time to get up and running. We should not. Kevin Smith! Woo! Yeah, absolutely. So, when it says successfully install end gems, you can use those gems. You hit Control Z and be done. So, uh, or if you don't want to, just turn it off. Uh, but I'm not going to change the default because I don't want to. <laughs> 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 Did Brian Davis tell you not to change the default, or is that your personal feelings? Oh, or, <laughs> Kittens. Eric doesn't have any kittens. I'm a puppy. Uh, well, not a real puppy. That's not a puppy. That's a dog. <laughs> You're not worthy of sympathy. It's a dog, dude. <laughs> Can you save us from this? I think the bottom line is that those, that documentation is an advanced feature, and advanced people know how to install it. And the people who don't, who aren't the advanced users, aren't going to use it anyway. Let's, let's talk about other things now. <laughs> Not documentation, but using the documentation that Ruby Gems installs in your system. Why don't we now talk about this anymore? Yeah. We have a question. Hopefully, not about documentation. How do you guys? Oh, yes. Fine. Never mind. Sorry, Pete. I've patched it. Looking at it right now. Fucking awesome. The parser is amazing. Yeah. Look at it. It's nuts. That's all I'm saying. Yeah! <laughs> cool, cool story. Cool story. Cool story, bro. Pete, so how do you guys feel about uh, turning the standard library into gems? And also, Steve, can you pronounce JavaScript? <laughs> <laughs> there are no. Okay. Oh, you gotta say the word. It's JavaScript. For you people, because you put W's in it. It's JavaScript. There we go, okay. <laughs> Where did all these extra W's come from? <laughs> Where did the sorting come from? <laughs> so, okay, what was the question again? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Do you pronounce it lava? Like lava? No, we say lava. Guess what? Here, this one's gonna blow your mind. When I go into Bibachi in Seattle to hang out with these fuckers, no, you know what? <laughs> That's a good fucking question, actually. <laughs> No, you, I'm all about consistency. I'm, you can be wrong. But thank you. I learned that word by hearing it, so that you are absolutely correct. When I go to Vivachi, I order a, I order a latte. And, and some pasta? No, I say a big one. I believe that the technical phrase is a big one, eh? <laughs> P, what was your other question? Standard library. Standard library. Standard oh, standard library is a gem. Great, great. Uh, yes, and I need to go bug Nahi about that. So it's just the thing that's hard about that is that the standard library right now is actually pretty hard pinned to specific versions of Ruby, so. We could fix that, but today the way that the standard library happens to be developed is that every time a feature changes in Ruby that necessitates change in the standard library, they just go change it. And then that thing that has been changed no longer works on older versions. And it works. Um, so you would have, you, what you would have to do is you would have to have, people would have to treat the standard library like they treat any other gem, which is... Nope. Backwards. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so sometimes we get backward things. Okay, there we go. Uh, things like encodings probably shouldn't be backwarded. When it's dead, it's fine. We got another couple months on the clock, but okay. There, whatever features get added in 2.0 may not be backwardable. The, the point is that up until now, the way the standard library has been developed is very locked to specific versions, and that would have to change.
Question. I got one. That guy. It's for Mr. Baker. <laughs> Who do you prefer, Terrence or Philip? <laughs> <laughs> Two dudes on South Park to talk about shit, am I correct? No, they are not from Canada. All right, I've got a. Uh, yes. Oh. I was just looking at the schedule, and uh, we've got Yehuda scheduled at three thirty for the closing keynote for today. Um, we actually scheduled a fairly long break after this talk. Would that be a Yehuda and Steve uh, cage match? <laughs> <laughs> well, one, I wanted to, I wanted to take this back for contrary to Ben, who you know is all about not educating. Um, I got a couple of questions that I want to ask while I've got these guys up here. Um, for the people in the audience, how many of you have actually contributed to an open source project? How many of you maintain an open source project? Because w one of the dynamics that, um, the, that I've seen and had some interaction with between Yehuda and Eric and Ryan and watching things come together between Rails and Merv and some of the things that happened there. Um, yeah. There is a lot of passion that's required to generate software and a lot of effort and hours in people's lives that go into creating the open source work that we all participate in and benefit from. There are consistently, and you get this with any time you take a fairly smart set of people and say work together under your own cooperative format. <laughs> so you get lots of clashing, but the, the point that Eric was making earlier about Aaron Patterson developing gray hairs is he came, so Aaron came to uh, his boss at the time while we were work, all working at AT&T Interactive and basically put together a proposal that said, it had a pie graph that said I spend eight hours a day working for AT&T Interactive, I spend four or five hours a day working on open source software. And I think there's two more slots in there. I don't remember exactly what they were. One had to do with sleep and the other one was life or something. Um, and then he proposed another graph that said, what I would like this to be is 12 hours a day of open source. And that's effectively what he got. That's why his hair is going gray. And that's exactly it. So, so one, of the, one of the things is that there's a ton of effort that goes into this stuff. I generally, um, for those of you who don't know me, I don't write a lot of code, and that's because the, I've written enough code in Ryan and Eric's presence to know that I'm better off hiring other people to get my code written. Um, so, but, but the, the big piece, and one of the things that I've tried to do, and one of the reasons why I'm going from G5, which is a smaller, locally ran startup, to AT&T, which is where I'm unemployed at the moment, but I will more than likely be inside of at and in the not too distant future. One of the reasons for that is because they represent a very large pool of resources, aka a very large pool of money and a very large pool of technical resources. Um, and I, you've now got me on my diatribe, so if you want me to stop, raise your hands. No, I like to um, okay. All right, so, one of the things that I, that I believe in, one of the things I'm trying to do by going back into AT&T is open source software is not free. And for every one of you who have released a project, you pay part of that cost. And part of what we're trying to do, part of what I'm trying to do at AT&T and what we've accomplished at AT&T Interactive where I believe this is a true statement and Eric can correct me, but Eric and Ryan now at this point are pretty much doing close to 100% of their time is also on open source software. Pretty much. So we've now got interactive basically employees <coughs> on that team, three engineers working on open source projects full time. They do not have other delivery responsibilities. When uh, salesforce.com bought Heroku, 
They then went out and hired Matt's, and have they got other contributors? No boom. They may have a couple more now. Who are also, and in hiring them, their job descriptions and what they were doing did not change. Actually, I guess John uh, Mantis has a new title, but his effective role did not change. So we were making inroads with a lot of corporations or with some corporations to help fund open source software. So instead of paying hundreds of thousands of dollars a year to license um, BEA or WebLogic or one of the other large Java frameworks, we're shifting and trying to shift the corporate mentality to the point where open source isn't free. For small companies, you end up letting your guys work on, or your people work on open source software with some portion of their time and release things that they create that benefit your company that don't necessarily have um, intellectual property value to your company, but do facilitate software development in general. Let them release that stuff because it benefits the community at large. And the only way that the open source community is going to continue to grow and continue to get healthy, and I think this applies to software development in general, is by spreading that attitude. Um, and part of it, to, to Eric, and I think Ryan said this also, is Eric, Aaron is older now. Time, time does flow, we all get older. Eventually, you may be an intern now, you may be an associate software engineer, you may be a senior engineer. Down the road, you're gonna end up running your own company, owning your own company, um, being a director in a larger company, being a principal architect in a larger company, keep this in mind. Keep the fact that open source software is not free in mind. Because otherwise, there is a chance that the open source environment collapses. And when it does, we go back to a proprietary world, which, in my opinion, is not a very pretty choice. Um, so part of the software craftsmanship, part of this movement is to continue to push that, whether it's your own personal contribution you do through your open source projects at home, or it's something that you can do as part of your workforce, continue to push to make that happen. Um, and then the, the part that I started on is, there are going to be disagreements. There was the Ruby gems, and what I read is slime gems, which was actually slim gem issue. There's going to be some degree of drama in the community around some of these things. Think about what you're saying, thinking about how you think about how you're saying it. And remember that some of the people that, that you are arguing with do put a lot of time into this. You put a lot of time into this. A lot of the times we have to figure out how to just get past those pieces. Some of them is acceptance, some of them you don't want to accept because it's wrong. And that's why we fork things. You know, is you create you create additional versions and fragmentation in my opinion is not horribly bad because generally what happens is in the case of Rails and Merv, they eventually came back together. But they they did that because there was some um, actual hard long thought that went into what happens if we continue down a major fragmented road with those two frameworks. So I'm going to uh, give the mic to to. Um, Yehuda here for a minute, but anyway, the, the big piece is continue doing what you're doing with open source, continue trying to make yourself better, continue trying to make those around you better. Um, it's not utopian. This is, it serves your own best interest. Now, I, I'm not a big fan of work doing everything for others. I do a lot of this stuff for my own benefit. So with that, I'll give I kind of want to reiterate what you were saying. Um, I, in general, open source software is harder than it looks, and in general, there are actual design differences that are that cause the disagreements. And I think, in general, what I usually try to do is try to understand what there's either assumptions or design differences that exist, and trying to understand those. It's very easy to get up and say like, "This is crazy. These people are doing retarded things." I think that's easy, and I think. Uh, in general, people who spend some thousands of hours of time writing software are usually not doing retarded things. They may have different values than you. I, for instance, I have very different values from the Node community. Okay? But I understand what their I understand what their values are, and identifying why my values and their values are different allows me to more easily either decide when to argue or when to just be like we disagree. And I think in general, when there are fights, that's like that's basically why Merv and Rails worked. Is that we like, there was a fight, we sat down, we said, okay, what are the actual differences? It turned out that the differences in values were mostly like prioritization questions. 
and adding a bunch more resources basically solved the prioritization problem. Like that's basically the core thing that happened there. So I think uh, I think I think it's, it's it's better to figure out what the values, what the axioms that people have are, than to just say like this person is perfect. So, uh, oh. the Rails merge was a mistake, though. Wow. <laughs> Do you want to talk about that? Uh, or, okay. So it wasn't. Um, I think. I think what the thing about the thing about Merv is that we were we had very low resources. We had specific goals that we wanted to achieve, and I, I think Matt's point about it was about performance. And in fact, there have definitely been performance regressions, especially around active record. Um, I think people don't usually do benchmarks of just action fact which actually has pretty good performance characteristics. But when you throw an active record, there were, there were like pretty crazy regressions. Um, but in the, the, the larger overall question of like, people who write plugins should have a more solid grant to stand. I think that for me, that was the big thing. People who are doing advanced stuff, they should have a more solid grant to stand on. They shouldn't be on quicksand, which was the case in Rails 2. And I think. I think the Rails presentation hit that on the head. Right? I, I've been waiting for that for years. And I think we did, I think, we got to the point where the, the API that plugins use is actually decently well defined now for most cases. It's obviously not perfect, but the, the fact of the matter is that when people upgrade to Rails 3.2, usually active record plugins are not breaking. Usually action controller plugins are not breaking. So. Yeah, we're seeing Rails users now for um, Yeah. I think so. Yeah. So you can tell me if I'm correct me if I'm wrong, but my feeling at this point is that Active Record has gotten most of the interesting features that were in Data Mapper that I cared about. Uh, yeah, it has gotten a lot of the features. Um, I don't know if we're necessarily would benefit from a merger right now. Um, we're actually looking at uh, doing some stuff, actually a, a true Data Mapper, where the uh, objects are actually just normal objects, and your mapper is separate, so you can test them separately. Oh yes, yeah, thank yeah. you. Nice. So the the way of emerge in general is is if the if the disagreements are resource constraints, then you can fix it with emerge, right? right? That's basically what happened with Rails is that we that Rails was like we would love to make to add more modularity, but we're basically we're all a bunch of volunteers and we have no full time. And engineer was like, seems good. We'll put two full time people on it. Suddenly there was no more resource constraint problem about making things more modular, right? And that that meant that the actual points of contention didn't really exist anymore. Yeah, someone needs to hire Dan. <laughs> <laughs> this is a little bit. Hold on. Buy Dan a beer for that. Colton, can you get Dan a beer? For Christ's sake. <laughs> Dan, get yourself a beer. <laughs> Dan, 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 get, get, get Colton a beer, if you wouldn't mind. No, I feel it. All right. Thank you. <laughs> oh, if you have something unrelated, do you mind if I just pop in real quick first? No. All right. So how many people actually get paid, say, to do open source maybe more than 20% of the time? How many would like to? Why haven't you asked your boss if you can? Why haven't you just done it? Yeah, seriously, just do it. What's stopping you? I mean, seriously, somebody tell me what's stopping you. Uh, a lot of employees that are working on projects are stuck in a corporate environment that don't have the luxury of contributing what they're producing to open source. Like for me, for instance, I can contribute to stuff that I produce at work, get paid for it, and then make it open source. And not, not a lot of people have that luxury. I mean, a lot of employers want to lock down everything that their employees produce. No, I I've worked job. in a hot job market. I've worked in that environment, and I've asked my boss, and I've gotten so permission. Anything I create is the intellectual property of my employer. Yeah, but so so is mine. Release it. Only so is mine. on your actual work agreement. Yeah, but I mean, the, the point I'm making yeah. is that there's no reason why that can't also be open source. Yeah, yeah. I release a ton of code that's it's copyright living not, social. It's really not that easy. I mean, you, so it's right. just what the because people, a lot of the people who are contributing open source are getting paid to do so. And so or, the question is the legal environment, right? I think. Well, so, like, are you guys using open source projects in your? Not class? especially, but when I write stuff, usually it depends. Right? But well, like, if you're using an open source project, you're going to get your back on that. I mean. I wager a lot of us are writing applications. A lot of us are working in Rails. We're writing a lot of the code is not so interesting. 
for some of the code that is interesting, at least for me lately, it's pretty damn proprietary. They my employer really does not want to get it out. So then why is the stuff that's not interesting not interesting? Because it's kind of boilerplate. It can't quite be automated, but it's almost like three clubs. Okay. I mean, there's inherited it resources. Inherited resources is the fucking shit. But, it doesn't, but it's not always the best. Yes. No, I agree. So, so I got to uh, 1999. where I am today by doing a lot of open source stuff. And sometimes it was just like, oh, we're working on this thing. It's kind of interesting. Um, so I'm just gonna, it's, it's generic enough that everybody else should be able to do this. And I've, how many people have heard of uh, AR Mailer? Yeah, so I, I wrote that and I extracted it out of uh, 43 things code base because I was like, well, you know, this is, this is something that we needed because Rails didn't provide a good enough way to send mails. So I was like, well, we'll just put it in the database and then we'll have another thing that sends it from the database and then can be completely decoupled. Page won't slow down. And I didn't ask any permission, I just, did it. Nobody cared, but yeah, I was I was working with a company that was small and didn't really care what I did. But there's I think there's a lot of it where you can just be like, this is a small thing, especially tiny things. You just do it and don't ask permission. And you know, hey, if you if they fire you yeah. for something like that, you probably don't want to work there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. If you if you get fired, you you there's probably a good sign that that's not a good place to work for. Well, yeah, but you should. Yeah. Yeah, you, if yes. You, yeah. Who has a who has an employer right now that will not let you open source shit that doesn't matter to your product? That does not that does not deliver specific business, business value to you, but is useful to the community. So it's, large. it usually has nothing to do with that, right? It usually has to do with the fact that the stuff you work on at work time is owned by your employer, and so you have to. There are bureau, there's a bureaucracy by which you have to find someone who will give you permission to do it. I didn't ask. Yeah. So if you so in a small company you can get away with it, but like if you work for a huge company, it's even in, less. I didn't ask. I haven't asked. I just asked okay. to work on open source at AT&T. So there's a problem. So now we are ba what we're basically doing is we're introducing open source into the wild that's owned by people who have not given permission to license yeah, it. I, 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 oh, I agree with you completely that that's not. No. Okay. So even if we don't, even if you don't care that about whether it's theft or not, what you're doing is you are actually you are making the choice to license something on. You are basically giving up the copyright of your employer. And there, there. I personally am very fearful of a day where that nuclear bomb explodes. I feel like that open source is full of that, and I, I'm scared of it. Well, that's so, SEO problem. I think like that's, I, I agree completely that that's not okay, but that should not stop anybody from asking permission. Like ask your manager, have your manager keep, just push on it until you get permission and you will. So if, you can't, if you can't sell it to your management, then it's not valuable to the company to do so. But most of the time for this generic stuff that costs a lot of money to maintain that other people can help you maintain, that's beneficial to the company anyway. So you I, should I, be able to sell it to the CEO or it's not valuable to the I suspect that we're probably on all in agreement that we would like to be able to release things into the open source that we do at work that are not proprietary. And you guys are right that there are policies in place that often prevent you from doing that at work in those environments. But these guys are right that we as people in this market, in the Ruby job market, as, as sellers of our, of our services in a very good place, because it's such a hot market, because it's such a seller's market, we're in a stronger negotiating position. We can make changes to those policies far more effectively today than we could, say, five or 10 years ago. And those policies are not going to change unless we work towards changing them. I, I don't think subverting them is correct, but if we're not trying to change them, you can't complain that they're not changing. So I work at a company in uh, Bank, based in Vancouver called First Bay. Probably haven't heard of because we only like Canadians. And so we move money between, we're, we do a lot of the services for, that PayPal does, but between businesses. And so one of the things that happened recently, a year ago, I guess, um, we realized, or before I joined the team, the team realized that a lot of what we do is CRUD. It's just the, the basic, let's list some data, let's edit the data, so on and so forth. And so they created a project called Active Admin. The entire web interface of our application is Active Admin. That gives us, the rest of us, the ability to focus on what we do, which is our core competency, which is actually moving large sums of money around um, every single night. And so it wasn't a hard sell to the CEO because we've gotten bug fixes from the community, we've gotten uh, help maintaining it from the community, we've gotten improvements, and we've got lots of other people using this thing, especially if you work in a small company that has a small user base. If you have a small piece of your code and you have 100 users or even 1,000 users, and you have a piece of code, then a thousand users at most are using that if you have a thousand users. But if you release it as open source, 
unlimited number of users can use that piece of code. It can exercise it. They can find bugs. They can add improvements. They can help you. I don't think there's any reason why you can't sell this to a CEO. There, there should be no reason why. Yeah. In a company that's hiring the reputation of the people that already work there, say there are there a lot of job tools that are attracting new talent. Absolutely. We, we, when we are looking at people, we, we look at new folks based on their open source contributions as well. Oh, sorry. The question, the, the statement was that people are value when they're hiring new people, they're valuing the contributions to the community. Right, and so, oh, that's, that's the other side of it. If somebody is active in the open source community, people that want to work there, it's a recruiting budget. I worked at ThoughtWorks for a little while. That sucked. But <laughs> Martin Fowler is paid out of the recruiting budget. Why is, why is that, that? That's what I'm paid out of. Exactly. So is Ryan. And Aaron. And Aaron. In the back. So the one breakdown that I see with this, though, is that you're assuming that your CEO, or in my case, people higher up, even understand what open source is. It's no, like Congress no, voting on SOPA. I mean, they have no idea what the hell they're talking explain about. explain this to them. Open source is not rocket surgery. So it is to a, if you have to talk to, if you have to, talk to a lawyer whose head is stuck up a certain orifice, it makes it difficult. This is the invented the, 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 the assembly line and the, and the reusable no, like, part. Here's the, here's the thing. It. If, they are, if they are reasonably intelligent people, you can get through to them. It may take some time. You may have to find new ways to frame it. But it's possible. I've seen it done a million times. There's a book all about this. It's called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. I'm serious. <laughs> Are you guys dead serious? Well, so, I, I've, so I, I've gone through this a couple of times now. Um, when I started at AT&T AT Interactive, which is where Ryan and Eric and Aaron work, is a wholly owned subsidiary of AT&T. And as such, there is a hand waving agreement between the guy who runs the division that Interactive is part of. So AT&T Interactive is the only company I've worked for where the CEO reports to a CEO who reports to a CEO who reports to the CEO. So there's literally four layers of chief executive officers. So I, I, I know what you're talking about, no bureaucracy, but Interactive had this hand wavy agreement that was basically the guy at the head of the division had an agreement with the CTO at AT&T that said, Interactive can break a lot of rules and because you're not on a trusted telecom network, we're gonna let you do that. Now, when, because I, I left Interactive and came to work for G5, and Chris Cragle's over here in the corner, um, who is a CTO at G5, one of the things that was a real pitch for me to go to G5 was when they'd gone and did the funding and brought in the venture, the venture money, um, Chris went through and looked at the entire code base and basically said of all of the code that's required to run our application, 40% of it's coming from open source. The other 60%, or I could be wrong on the numbers, the other 60% is stuff that we've developed in-house. Because of that, if you want to attract the right talent at the company, we have to have some commitment to supporting the open source effort. Now, if, if you're in an organization where the CEO barely knows that your department exists, or if you're in an entertainment company in LA where IT is a cost center, it is not intellectual property rights, then the battle is going to be hard. The battle is going to be, may very well be impossible. And to your point, yeah, we all have families. Most of us do not, I mean, most of us work and we do this because we're passionate about it. I mean, the reason you're here, I don't know, how many people are here paid for this out of their own pocket? Okay, so you've still got a big chunk of this room or at this conference because you care enough to spend the money and to spend your time to come down here. How many people here are on vacation right now? Okay, so you got a little bit of cooperation from your employers. <laughs> um, so so it, it is a struggle. The, the other piece I was talking about though, I left AT&T Interactive because my boss went from being the CTO at Interactive to taking a VP position at AT&T Corporate. And I was supposed to move with him and my teams were supposed to move with us. And if that transition had gone through, what Ryan and Eric and Aaron do as part of their daily job was a terminatable offense inside of AT&T Corporate. Because AT&T had policies within the 
this is what they call the CTO organization. They had policies that said, you can use open source software if it's on this whitelist. And you can fill out exception paperwork to get onto the whitelist. And we figured out how to manipulate the system so that you quit putting down version numbers and you only put major version numbers so you didn't have to go back through the process every time. But that was their idea of open source. You could contribute a patch back to an open source project after legal reviewed the code. Legal reviewed the code. Um, there was no concept within that part of the organization of releasing an open source project. It, it hadn't occurred to them, and it wasn't in their mindset to take a project and set it loose in the wild, to give up an intellectual property right. Didn't they yes. Grapviz came from, this is the other fun part. <laughs> if you don't know, Grapviz is released by AT&T. Grapviz is released by AT&T Labs. So there are lots of segments within the larger AT&T organization who manage to get exceptions in how this behavior happens. And the, the team that I'm going to be rejoining, um, if you didn't see the announcement, AT&T officially joined the OpenStack community and is now a partner as part of it. I'm not sure what the terminology is, I haven't researched it, but they have actually put the AT&T logo, which the folks in the branding department literally look at, if our logo shows up on your website, it's worth this much money to you. Do they call it the Death Star? They do not call it the Death Star. <laughs> we, we have graphics of the Death Star superimposed on the logo, and it's awesome. Um, but anyway, so there, I, there are absolute issues with doing this within large companies, within small companies where um, the value of what you're doing is not always there, or is not always perceived. Um, part of it, you know, part of it is if you can't, it's that maximum, if you can't change your job, change your job, that's not an easy answer. And it's, it's not always an easy answer, and sometimes it's not the right answer. Um, but, I, I mean, Wozniak did it with the original Apple One, when he went to HP with his design and basically said, do you guys want this? If not, can I have permission? If you're not going to do anything with it, can I have the permission to release it or go do my own thing with it? And, and I think that's the main thing is if you've got something that you think is going to be valuable to the community, at least have that discussion. Try to have that discussion if you can, which is this represents no intellectual property value to the company. If you want to do something more with it and you want to help put resources behind it, great. It's, it's valuable. It's valuable to me. I'm passionate about it. I care about it. And if you don't want to own it and help um, feed it and nourish it, then let me let it go. Let me put it into the community. Don't just kill it. Some people aren't going to get that. They aren't going to care. They're going to tell you to go back to your cube and leave them alone. And part of that comes back to that that's when you should really be looking, whether it's uh, Timmy Crawford's idea of just going to work for yourself or looking for another employer. You know, there, there, there are a lot of people hiring. There are a lot of caveats on hiring. You know, I had the discussion with, when Eric said we're try, trying to hire him again, we had a discussion the other day about whether or not there was any value in moving them from interactive to AT&T. We're not done with that discussion, but right now they're in a better place where they're being paid out of an engineering, marketing, recruiting budget. If they move to my team, I need them to deliver stuff that is proprietary and, hasn't, and can't be open source. So there would be some loss in the amount of time they could spend on open source. So right now, we'll, we'll, that, that's more or less off the table at the moment. Um, but there, there's, there's a lot to this process. And I'm probably running on now, huh? Okay, so we've got, let's take a 15 minute break. I can have one other thing. Sure. If, uh, you know, there's some companies who actually will refuse to uh, allow you to put out anything that you create as open source. So an alternative to that could be to uh, allowing their employers or partners to having, you know, five hours a week to work on open source projects. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the point, the thing is, you just have to ask. Like, if yeah. it's important to you, ask. And if they say no, find a new job. 
eight. And it's not like quit immediately and then, you know, but like start looking for a job that can fulfill. Start, start attending conferences, start talking to our user groups, local groups, yeah, talk to other people. There are lots and lots of people in the community. There are lots of people in this room who are looking for people who give a rat's ass about what you do with your software. It's a seller um, market. You'll be in <laughs> 15 minutes. Yes. Companies are hiring Rails developers right now. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let, let, let's keep, keep your hands up for just a minute. The, the question was, who's in companies that are hiring? Oh yeah. Okay. Now for the next question is, if you are a hiring manager who is hiring, keep your hands up. Okay. Look around the room if you are not happy with where you're at. <laughs> There are faces here who are responsible for bringing new people onto teams who probably have a better understanding of open source than your current employer. If that, you know, if you're in that environment. There were people who were not hiring. Scarcity. That's what I'm saying about the in the market, the scarcity in the market would be the problem. All right, well, Thank you all for your participation. Um, we're going to take a 15-minute break, and then we're going to come back, and you're going to give us our keynote.